a little about me. 15 years ago, as of last Monday, I came to West LA to Marina Del Rey by way of Connecticut. Uh, it was my first four way into the West Coast, and I quickly became, I fell in love with being out here. I originally came out as an intern at Tom Shoots. I went to school at George Washington University, and I was interested in finding the space between nonprofit mission driven organization and with an interest in entrepreneurship, uh, a for profit organization that could really be sustainable and grow and scale. Because that's what I was, I saw both sides. And I was wondering, could there be a space that could combine both of those ideas? So I came across the idea of Tom Shoes, the idea of one for one purchasing a pair of shoes and giving a pair of shoes to a child on need. And so for me, that really connected with what I was looking for uh, uh, an organization that could really help them all by everyday purchases. And I thought this is a, a profound idea, a different way of doing business that really resonated with me. And so I thought that was my goal to really get involved and start there. So 15 years ago, uh, I was an intern at Tom's and I was there for seven years. I was profoundly shaped by going on giving trips and giving shoes to children who didn't have shoes, something as basic as shoes. Uh, had something so meaningful, uh, provided, gave them the opportunity to better their lives, to make their lives easier, and also to inspire them to be able to do the things that we just take for granted with something as simple as shoes. In 2014, I was, you know, browsing the internet as one does, and I came across this fascinating article. And this article was by uh, a gentleman named Scott Sanders, and he wrote about this idea that he had just come across and felt compelled to share with, with just the broader community. And this idea was the concept of universal basic income. And it was fascinating to me was I went to school for human services, not probably, and sociology. In, in all my years and all my studies, I had never come across this idea, this profound idea of just ensuring that people had a basic amount of money as a starting point in income floor. And I thought, oh, is this a new idea? Is this something that has been around, you know, just, just came about and is being introduced for the first time? And, I, and through Scott's writings, I gradually learned that this idea has been around for hundreds of years. It's taken on different forms, it, it, it described by different people in different ways. But ultimately, it's about ensuring that people have a basic amount of cash as a starting point. Full stop. Specifically, uh, I learned that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke and wrote about universal basic income right up until he passed away, right until he was assassinated. So there have been entire movements around this idea in the 30s and 40s through the Nixon administration in the 60s and 70s. Pilots were done nationwide. It was talked about. It almost passed as a bill under a Republican Congress. It was just mind-blowing that this information had been around, this idea had been around. And I had never really heard of it. It had not been brought to my attention. So through Scott's work, I was truly inspired. It's like a lightning bolt went off, right? When you hear about an idea that just hits you the right way, and you're just like, I have to get involved. And so for me, that meant getting involved in any way I could. And at that time in 2014, the UBI community was still relatively small. It had been an idea that had gone in and out of vogue. And so this was sort of a, a quiet period. But there was a growing group of people that recognized that the moment we were living through would require an idea like universal basic aid for a lot of different reasons, um, many of which have been time tested, like social justice, like ensuring that all people have a, an inherent level of economic dignity, a, a level of freedom that we should all respect and enjoy with each other. And then more, more recently around technological disruption, more around the fact that people's work and livelihoods are being affected by the, the work that is being done by machines, by automation, uh, the works that we have helped create, we've contributed to the technology in our own ways, our taxes, our contributions to government projects, and also to the, uh, the very training methods, the data that is being collected and used to train for the machines and the automation of tomorrow is being used on our work, all of our, all of our posts, our tweets, all of that information. So we have all contributed to this coming technological disruption. So through many different reasons, I wanted to get involved. And again, the community was so small that I was able to connect with 
many different fantastic people all interested in UBI, including a gentleman who I met at a conference named Andrew. And Andrew was coming off his own work in the nonprofit. He had realized that technological disruption was affecting the Midwest and manufacturing jobs and wanted to speak out about it. So I emailed him and I said, we should really work together. I really like how you and I vibed and connected around supporting UBI. He said, I'll be ready for president. So if you want to help me with that, that would be great. Uh, that was 2017, just uh, early days. Uh, he decided that he was going to run for president. Uh, it was an audacious idea, but an important one because as as time went on, we realized that he was really the only candidate to talk about UBI as this subject that was worth considering. Uh, a lot of other politicians have since talked about it. This has gained a lot of national attention for mayors and local officials, but at the time, he really was helping bring UBI into national conversation. Flash forward to 2020, and uh, I know there was a lot that happened in 2020, but through the presidential race, uh, Andrew made it on stage and was able to talk about UBI to a national audience, and then was able to speak about the importance of ensuring people have a guaranteed amount of income right up until the pandemic happened. And he dropped out of the race, but the idea of giving people some sort of cash, some sort of income, uh, sort of became really relevant because in the pandemic, we all received pandemic checks. We all received unconditional cash checks from the government directly to everybody. And it was efficient, and it was necessary, and it was timely, and it was doable. I think for the first time, people saw that this idea could be done. And not a moment too soon because the pandemic, yeah, it was it was rough for many of us, for all of us. Uh, and recognizing that ensuring people had some income became a top priority of the government. So that was sort of the beginning of the proof that I believe we are having happen, so that more of us can accept this idea as we move forward in time. Uh, the pandemic checks have long gone, but our work still remains to ensure that this idea becomes the new foundation, the new part of a social contract for all Americans, for all of us here in the United States, and hopefully for all other countries. Um, hopefully we will be the first country to implement UBI. It may be another country. It will be exciting to see who gets there first, but I believe that this is the work that needs to be done. We have demonstrated the importance of it. We have the data through the, through the uh, all the pilots, all the examples we have. We have seen what happens when Children, have, uh, their families have enough money to provide for their kids, for people to be able to start new endeavors and be more creative and say no to dangerous work and say yes to more opportunities to be truly free economically to, to choose what's best for them. So that's the work I'm here to do. Uh, my organization, Build the Floor, and a number of other organizations I will mention that are, that are trying to do this very So again, what is UBI? This is the technical term for UBI. It is a, as, as best we can describe it, because the concepts and the idea is, can be a little uh, variable depending on who you speak with. So the best definition, the most updated definition we have is it's a periodic cash payment that is universal, individual, and unconditional. And each of those pieces is very important, right? Periodic is that it is consistent over time cash payment, it comes in the form of cash. It's not a service, it's not uh, It's not uh, some other form of a, a food stamps or any other form of condition. It is just straight cash. It is universal, very, very important. The idea that everybody would get it. And we can talk more about what that looks like and why it should be universal, but ensuring that everyone in a community would receive some form of cash. It's individual. So it is not tied to a spouse, it is not tied to family. Every individual would receive it for themselves and thus allowing them to make the decisions best for them. And unconditional, it is not associated with whether you work, a specific kind of work. Uh, it's not through paid employment, it is just for you, unconditional. And that's also very, very important. Oh, important. So I'm gonna show you a short two minute video that helps summarize a little bit about the UBI movement. There's been a growing amount of media and content to describe and talk about UBI. So I've included two videos, two short videos here to give you a little bit of an update and then we can we can go from there. America, 
we are the richest country on earth, and indeed, the richest civilization that has ever existed. We put a man on the moon. We invented the internet, the assembly line, and the galaxy. More billionaires live here than anywhere else on earth. And we are widely acknowledged as being the most powerful single nation around. But for a country so wealthy and so innovative, our living standards are not only great, our infant mortality and child poverty rates are among the highest in the developed world. Americans can expect to live shorter and thicker lives compared with people living in many other rich democracies. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And of the 10 richest countries, the United States comes in last in terms of mobility and opportunity. The United States is so rich, and yet so many of its citizens remain impoverished. There's a big idea out there that could help solve this. It's called a universal basic income. The government would give everyone, say, $500 or $1,000 a month, no strength attached, sort of like a social security payment. A basic income would help eliminate poverty, especially deep poverty and poverty among children. It would give workers more bargaining power. With that kind of safety, people might become more entrepreneurial and take more risks. They might free themselves from abusive figures in their lives. They might go back to school. They might make more art. They might choose to spend more time with their family or take care of their elderly relatives or volunteer in their community. And economists think it is unlikely that many people would stop working. Just look at lottery winners. 85% of them continue to work. Studies even show that people might be more productive, healthier, happier, and more cohesive as a society. Most importantly, a UPI would give Americans basic security and more control over their lives. There are some downsides to the UPI. It would cost a lot, though the United States is a relatively low tax country right now, and we can afford it. It might lead some people to stop working, particularly older workers, younger workers, and the parents of little kids. It might create inflation with prices rising since everybody would have more money to spend. It also might be great against our deep-seated belief that nobody should get something for nothing. The idea of a basic income isn't new. It's been around for more than 500 years, with everybody from Martin Luther King Jr. to Richard Nixon to Bill Gates supporting some version of it. We are living in a time of great technological advancement and enormous abundance, but poverty continues. Some families have private inheritances, passing on their accumulated wealth. A basic income would be like a social inheritance, sharing the wealth that this society has created and eliminating deprivation for everything. So I really enjoyed that video because it does a very good job of summarizing so many things about UBI and and we can definitely dive into lots more about <clears throat> what the video spoke about. I'll do that with this. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about why for me UBI is important, has been important, should have been implemented a very long time ago, but if if not then, then now. Why UBI now? So first, the way I like to talk about UBI is to describe it as a basic level of economic security, dignity, and freedom. The idea that ensuring people have their basic needs met is something that should just be the way things are, right? That's how we should run a society. That's how we should treat each other. When people have a basic sense of economic security, their lives change. I was fortunate enough to be born into a family that gave me a universal uh, child income, basically, um, a universal parental income, because my family had the means to give me my most basic needs and, and then some. And I didn't have to worry about the basic needs of my life. Uh, my family was able to, to take care of that for me, and that was profoundly important. I grew up knowing other children who didn't have that opportunity, who weren't as fortunate. You could see the challenges that they struggled with because they didn't have those basic needs met. In spite of their parents working, in spite of their parents loving them, uh, it was never about love or, or how much they cared for their kids. It was just about money. A sense of dignity, I think, is really important when we talk about UBI 
we want to talk because people think, oh, you shouldn't receive in cash. You should, uh, it's not appropriate or it's it's not dignified. It's like not, you're not worthy of just receiving something for quote unquote nothing. But the idea of ensuring that we all treat each other with a sense of dignity should go economically as well. It's not just in how we treat each other, you know, with our words, but how we treat each other with our society and how we allow each other to participate in that society. I think that when we talk about dignity, having an economic sense of dignity, ensuring that we trust one another with the means to provide decision-making for themselves as to what's best for them. Each of us knows what's best for ourselves and can make those choices. And we should dignify each other with that level of basic support. Um, I think that's critically important as we talk about different programs and other ways that we quote unquote can try to help people, but that can come off as paternalistic or moralistic or putting our own preconceived judgments about what should and shouldn't be done. Uh, just going back to trusting each other is really important. And this, this idea is, is literally trusting people with the economic power to make the best decisions for themselves. So I think that's really important. And then freedom. Freedom is a word that we sometimes take for granted in America because we say it all the time and it means sort of general things. Um, but here, economic freedom, I think, is critically important. We need to believe that if we're going to trust each other with this basic level of dignity, the freedom to make those decisions is, is incredible. We have to trust each other that everyone has the freedom and should have the freedom to know what's best for them. And so that means having the freedom to say no to the kinds of work or labor that we traditionally don't necessarily give people the choice to say no to, right? There are tons of jobs that we have existing right now because people can't say no to it because they have no other choice. They can't opt out and find something that pays better because of their current situation. We can get rid of those jobs and we should get rid of those jobs. And one way to get rid of those jobs is to create a society where people have the power to say no. I had the power to say no to plenty of opportunities for jobs when I was a kid so that I could focus on going to school full-time, getting my education, and then having the opportunity to intern. Being an intern is an economic choice um, or an economic freedom that I had and I possess that many people don't have. We can fundamentally change our society for the better by helping get rid of those jobs or at least have those jobs pay more to attract people to freely choose them of their own volition. And I think that is a profound shift in how we would run our society that can't be overstated. Uh, and those jobs, if nobody wants to do them, we will automate them away. That's the beauty of technology. That's the beauty of how we operate in society. If, if, if there's an opportunity to create a business that can automate or replace jobs that nobody wants to do, we should do that. And the best way to do that is to ensure that people can say no to those jobs until there's a reason for someone to automate them away. So saying no to, to terrible jobs and then saying yes to opportunity, saying yes to the things, the kind of work that people really want to do. I think we're in a profound time of transformation economically. And there's going to be kinds of jobs, kinds of work that we have not done in the past, not because we didn't want to do it, but because it didn't pay enough. We didn't have the time or the energy or the resources to focus our time and attention on those jobs. And as we're seeing with technology, there is a, a fundamental changing going on where the kinds of jobs that will be harder and harder to replace are the jobs that technically may not pay as much as other jobs that we do today, white collar labor, uh, computer work, just engineering, journal, journalistic skills, like a lot of the things that we take for granted that are secure white collar jobs that pay well are the kinds of jobs that are now in danger of automation, the kinds of jobs that will never go out of style that people want to do, caring for their community, working with their neighbors, volunteering, creating a sense of community, coming together, hosting gatherings, parties, you know, the kinds of things that we do in our free time, if we have it, what if we could do more of that? What if we were more free to do those kinds of things? What if we were more free to have the kinds of work and caring for each other so that we built a caring economy? Because that's what's the important thing. That's the, the connection with each other. That's what's time that we should be spending doing and less of the other stuff that can actually be technically replaced or done differently going forward. But we need a way to get there. Second point, the moral action against poverty. Again, just from a general sense, why do we have poverty? We don't need it. It's a, it's a construct that we've created ourselves. We've created a society where people have to work 
quote unquote, or have income either provided by their families to survive in this, in this world. You can't go into a, a, a little plot of land and create your own house you can create your own little society. Everything's been privatized. You can't find your way out of the system. And so if this is the system that we have, we should not have poverty. We can just get rid of it. It's a choice. We've recognized that we can legislate it away and, and recognize that no one should be in poverty, just as a starting point. I think that we kind of forget that when we're talking about these numbers and talking about these concepts, like poverty is also just a concept that we've allowed ourselves to say that it just exists because of the market and how things are set up. It doesn't have to be that way. Like we really can make that choice um, as a society. So just, just from that point alone, I think that's something to consider when we talk about UBI. The technological disruption. So this idea, like we the video mentioned, I've mentioned, has been around for many, many years. And there were always good reasons to support this. But I think it was a real struggle to get people who may, may not be as, shall we say, thoughtful or considerate of others' struggles because they thought, well, I'm doing okay. I don't have anything to worry about. I'm working hard. Other people should work hard too. They are in their own situation because of what their choices were. Now we're getting to a point where the technology that we have helped create and shape is going to affect everybody. It's not just a small group of people in the Midwest in automation for manufacturing. It's not just a few things here or there that it doesn't affect the broader landscape of what we do for work. Every basic task that we do today, especially in a technologically advanced society as ours, can and will be affected by automation. And that's just, it's just becoming an increasingly clear fact. So the people who may have not, well, this isn't something for me to concern, to be concerned about, they should be concerned about. It. It's going to affect them. And it may not lead to total job replacement, but it will lead to job disruption. It will lead to challenges in figuring out what is the work that I should and could be doing with my time, my most valuable asset in my life, which is my time. We need to prepare each other and our whole society as we go through this shift. It's already happening. We're seeing it in our day to day. I'm using technology in ways I haven't before. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there is so much more to come. And we can build a society that is truly benefiting all of us if we have that technology in place. If we also have the social structures, the infrastructure, the foundation of a UBI and other social programs to help support that transition. This is where it can come off as a little utopian, a little pie in the sky. Oh, we're just going to have the robots do all the work and we're just going to sit around and hang out and enjoy each other. Well, to some degree, that is like the air, the direction I'd like to head. To. I would like to focus on a world where we are focusing our time and attention on each other, focusing our time and attention on the things that matter to us and the things that we're choosing to spend our time on. Instead of the unnecessary work that we can either automate away or just shouldn't exist. That's at least my hope. And I'm hopeful we will get there in a little bit. And then finally, a lot of this discussion has been seen as theoretical. This has been, oh, this sounds nice. This is a great exercise in mind, but where's the proof? How do you know this is going to work out? How do you know that people are going to do the things that you think they're going to do when you talk about UBI? And the point is, is that we have the data. We have so, so much data and we have more data coming in the next couple of months and years. Be on the lookout. You'll be hearing more pilots. There have been hundreds of pilots now that have been giving cash to individuals in different economic circumstances. And we've been getting that information back and what they're doing with it, how it's impacted their lives. And it's all great. It's all positive. It's the things that we assumed were going to be the case. And now we've got the proof. I'd like to show you another quick video that will summarize some of those pilots that have been taking place in the last year, in the last couple of years, uh, headed by the Economic Security Project, an organization I'm a part of, and Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, which is a collection of mayors across the country who have brought, excuse me, which have brought cash transfers and providing income directly to their constituents and seeing what happens uh, when, their, when their residents receive some income directly. From the shores of Santa Monica to the streets of Chicago, 
From the mountains of Denver to the fields of Cuthbert, Georgia, people are putting food on the table, supporting their families, living better lives with a guaranteed income. This started in 2017 with just two pilots receiving seed funds from the Economic Security Project, a bull provocation in Jackson, Mississippi, and the very first municipal-led program in Stockton, California. They shared their playbook and invited others to take up the cause. Now what started as an experiment has become a movement. There are now 100 guaranteed income demonstrations that have been announced across the country. That's over 38,000 people who have received money. No strings attached. People with the power to make choices for themselves, the stability to care for their children, the freedom to explore new careers. For former foster care youth, a guaranteed income was the springboard they needed to complete their college degrees. For Tydrika, it was a tool to invest in her community by starting a nonprofit for Black girls. For Tamara, it was the stability she needed to prioritize her well-being and family. And they are not alone. 36 million families received the child tax credit in 2021. This groundbreaking experiment helped cut childhood poverty in fact, in effect, creating a guaranteed income for children. Can you imagine how this idea will transform our neighborhoods, our communities? It's more than just a check. It's the freedom everyone deserves. We have the proof, we have the data. There will be more pilots that will be concluding and more data coming out shortly. There are even some that weren't mentioned here that will be uh, coming out hopefully this year. Uh, we know that UBI works. We know that giving cash to people works. And we know that there are incredible benefits that help families, that help communities. But there are also concerns that people have, and, and understandably so, especially because there is no example of having a nationwide basic income, a universal basic income across the country. And to be fair, you can't really test a universal basic income across the country for an extended period of time. Although we did have the pandemic and we did receive pandemic checks and it was a direct amount. So we have the first step of what that might look like. And we now know what it takes to implement it nationwide. But now let's talk about some of the challenges, some of the the roadblocks that people have when mentally trying to get behind this idea and support this idea. The first one is cost, and that's understandable when you do the basic math and you take a basic income, say, everyone to the poverty line is a starting point, you multiply it by 300 million people, that's a very big number, and understandably so. Before we talk about how to pay for it in the context of dollars and cents, it is worth considering the world that we have built today and the cost of not having a universal basic income in place. Because we quantify the costs of poverty as best we can, even though in some ways they are unquantifiable, but we, we do our best to estimate that. And we start to pull the numbers together. How much is poverty costing us? How much is child poverty costing us? How much is it costing us to incarcerate so many people for so many nonviolent crimes, for things of economic need rather than of, of any real harm? What is the cost of worse healthcare outcomes when people can't take care of their own health that gradually gets worse and worse? We have some numbers. We have an idea that childhood poverty alone is a trillion dollars. And again, how do you quantify the loss to the community and to all of us in the untapped potential of our kids and the untapped potential of people doing work that is meaningful for them, that is thriving and important to the community. Honestly, we can pay for basic income if we just recognize that fact. The cost of the society that we built in terms of poverty and the, the damage that we're doing to ourselves, that we're choosing to do for ourselves, is in the trillions. It's just clear. But if we want to talk dollars and cents, we can go down the road of, well, we can recognize that if we ensure that everyone has a basic level of economic security, uh, that would mean that everyone would receive it. We can use that as a springboard to recognize that we can have a more fair tax system so that those who are the wealthiest among us can pay more of their fair share. And if they were to lose all of their money overnight, they would have a basic income to still have 
at the end of the day. And that is the beauty of the universal aspect, right? No one should go without it. But if you have succeeded in the world of our society, where you, you've made so much money, you will probably pay more into a system than you are receiving from a basic income. But the universality and the unconditionality is the most important because the thing that drives people against each other, especially around social programs, is the worthiness of who should get it, who shouldn't get it. That this group is deserving and this group is not. That I should get it. But that that person over there, I have thoughts about what they would do with it. And we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, the cost at the general sense, we can pay for it if we truly recognize how much our society is already paying for a world without universal basic income. And then we can do a good, we can have that discussion about what kinds of programs can be folded in, what kind of programs may be a little bit redundant, and then what kind of uh, tax system we can better structure so that everyone is paying their fair share into uh, an economy in a society that has basic income as a startup. Inflation. So a word that's get thrown around a lot these days. Uh, people point to the idea, well, if everyone receives money, then everyone's just going to raise the rent. Everyone's going to raise the prices. And again, I want to, as much as I've been talking about how important UBI is, I want to make clear that UBI is not a silver bullet. It does not solve every problem, but I believe it makes every problem easier to solve. Inflation can come in a lot of different places, rent, groceries, and so forth. And so those are large scale issues that we need to address that may not be able to be addressed just with cash, right? We need strong laws in place to ensure that people have affordable, dignified housing and that there's enough housing around to go for everybody. And UBI isn't a replacement for healthcare. Like healthcare, it doesn't matter if you're receiving a couple thousand dollars, a thousand dollars a month or basic income, healthcare should be its own necessary right for all of us. So getting those ideas out of the way, we can put in price structures and laws to ensure that people won't just raise costs on individuals if they were to receive income. But we do have examples of people receiving a form of income over time and what happens. The best example we have that is actually here in the United States, and it's in Alaska. In Alaska, every member or every resident in Alaska, man, woman, and child, has been receiving basically an oil dividend, a distribution of wealth from the land in which this oil is being pulled out, and have been receiving it for, I believe, over 35 years. And that income comes with a big celebration. It's a big deal in Alaska when everyone receives the, their, their dividend check. And you could think that, oh, if, if everybody knows this money is gonna go to everyone's you know, uh, bank account on this particular day, everyone's gonna raise their prices. Like, there's the money, we're just gonna raise prices. But what happens is there's competition. There's uh, a frenzy for all the local businesses in, that, in the Alaskan area that they recognize they have to compete with one another for those dollars. And so what ends up happening is you have sales. You actually have lower prices because of competition. You can see the same thing happen in food deserts, right? If you don't have competition, those are, when the, those are the opportunities for it businesses to raise prices because there is no competition. But when there is, that's when businesses fight for your dollars. So in Alaska, that's like one of the biggest sales of the year is when they receive their dividend checks, their, their own version of a guaranteed income. So we have some examples. Again, this has been for decades. So we've seen these different examples. Now it's impossible to truly quantify what would happen if everyone received a basic income because that's you just can't you can't model that out perfectly. But we can ensure with working government and working laws that we can keep inflation and other challenges tapered down and under control, ensuring that people can use their basic income for their basic needs. Perhaps the most important and the most challenging argument against a UBI is comes in some form of this, which is, okay, I get what you're saying. I'm all for it because I know what I would do with the basic income. I know how this would help me. I know how this would help my family. I'm fine with that. But what about other people? What about the person that I have this made a vision of what they would do with the money? They would use it irresponsibly. They would use it to be lazy. They would waste it. They wouldn't use it in the way that I would use it. Don't get me wrong. I know what to do with it. But other people, I don't know if we can trust other people. 
This, I think, is the most fundamentally challenging part about UBI, and it is also the greatest issue we need to cross together. We need to recognize that there is no other. There isn't. There just isn't. Every person, when I speak to them, has an idea of what UBI would mean for them and their families, their communities. They get it. That's everybody. Every person has that idea. Every person has that story. Every person understands what's best for them. You just have to remember that everyone else is part of that community too. There is no other. We also have the data. We have demonstrated that when people receive a basic income from a variety of economic situations, they use it in the way that we imagine they would use it for. They would use it to take care of their families, to pay off bills, to give themselves and their children more opportunity, to improve their lives, because that's what they want to do with their time and their energy and their life. That's what they're looking to do. They just need a little bit of economic support, a little bit of a boost, a little bit of an economic floor. We don't have people who just are lazy or, or use it to waste time or whatever. And even if they did, let's go back to point number one, economic freedom. Everyone should be entitled to have some level of economic freedom. And if that comes in the form of taking a bit of a break, taking a vacation, going out to eat, go see a movie, participating in the economy and helping moving through goods and services, that should be okay too. If we're gonna talk about entrusting each other with a level of dignity, we need to allow each other to make mistakes, to try new things, to fail, and to be given the opportunity to get back up again. So hopefully you have a better understanding of why there is no other when we talk about UBI and why the universality and the unconditionality is so very, very important. I'd like to begin to close by talking about a couple of resources that I can email you, but you can also check out here. Scott Santens is the writer who introduced me to UBI. He's been a prolific writer and actually has crowdsourced his own basic income so that he can continue to do this work as his job. Uh, I've gotten to know Scott over the years from merely reading with him to helping work with him in a number of different uh, occasions. He is an incredible writer. His articles can get very detailed and long, but I urge you to check some out. He has plenty of resources, whether it's books to go check out, uh, a, a running Twitter uh, thread that's been around, I think, five, six years now that has evidence after piece of evidence after piece of evidence that comes out about why UBI is so effective and important. And he has a number of different uh, works that he's building, uh, something called Comingle, uh, which we can get into after. But just, he's a great resource to learn more about UBI and to share, especially if your friends like to read. He's the go-to for resources, for articles that cover just about every part of the UBI discussion. Income Movement is an incredible organization that focuses on advocacy for universal basic income. They put together the Basic Income March that actually takes place here in East LA in the past couple of years, helps put on the major basic income conference here in the United States. I've been a volunteer and a longtime supporter of theirs, and they do incredible work uh, as a nonprofit to help introduce and continue the conversation of UBI, bringing the community together so that we can have these conversations and then share with the community at large. And then there's my, my little website, buildthefloor.org. That's where I've used to help explain basic income to others. For me, it really is about building a floor, a foundation for everybody. Uh, I feel like that is framing that we should really recognize as critically important, especially in these turbulent times where the ground does seem shaky. Almost at the end of the time, uh, where, where it seems like things are shifting every day and where we don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring or how that might affect our lives. Having a floor is something we shouldn't take for granted and something that we really need to create for ourselves and for each other. And so that's why I feel the floor is, is you know, what I feel really passionately connected to. All right, it is now time for my favorite part, the Q and A. So I'd be happy to take any and all of your questions. We can get into all sorts of philosophical debate, or um, we can just chat. 
So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to hearing from you. Is that a stretch or a question? Okay. <laughs> Just stretch. So I um, I remember in 1984 in Boston walking down the street and there was an election year and somebody was handing out flyers for the American Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind and thought, but I didn't think that was allowed in America. Mm -hmm. And so ever since then, I, I, I've really been uh, reticent of anybody treating any idea or philosophy as the building. I'm not susceptible to the building reality, but it clearly feels like a lot of people would think, uh oh, this sounds like what I was taught happens in a socialist economy where poverty just isn't accepted. So I've always liked the idea that the government would say, we brag so much about how we're number one, and we do not allow poverty to exist here. Yet we do. So, what happens when people ask, "Is this communism?" <laughs> yeah, that's that is a question that is passed around a lot. And I guess first we should look at. And again, I'm not the expert in communism, but uh, I believe with communism, socialism, it's around owning the means of production. Right? It's about controlling everything and then everyone getting an equal share, uh, regardless of what you do. Right? So in this case, UBI is the floor in which everyone starts from, but as, as we heard from Rutger, uh, there is no ceiling. So everyone can start, there's a starting point for everybody, but there isn't a ceiling in which that people can hit. Although we can talk about if you hit a billion dollars, should there just be a cap and be like, hey, you won, you won capitalism, like here's a trophy and you know, all your future earnings get taxed from there. But like, there isn't necessarily, it's not like we're owning the means of production. We're still ensuring private markets for ensuring a free market, although that's a whole conversation. Do we have a free market if people don't have money that they can freely decide for themselves what to do in that market? I would say no. I could say that actually having UBI actually creates a more free market. That's more free than the one we have today. So it's not, but it is easy to say like, oh, well, people are getting something for quote unquote nothing. That's just one of these other ideologies. It's not. In fact, <laughs> there are folks who are in those camps that say that this idea does not go far enough, just as many people as who do say from the capital side of the point of view that are like, this goes too far. So if we're making everybody kind of a little uneasy about it, we're probably doing something right. And, and I think that is really important, um, especially as we brought this idea as the UBI movement has come back into people's attention. I think people are recognizing that our system is fundamentally broken in a lot of different ways. And an idea like UBI, would actually help facilitate the improvement of this structure that we have without blowing it up, right? Without fundamentally flipping it on its head. We're actually reinforcing that floor within the system we have today. And I think that is a critical piece we, um, as opposed to saying uh, any of those ideologies being the case. Say some more about uh, their business, like you're helping another person that's helping yourself. <coughs> say some more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think well, for me, uh, I was raised Jewish. And so the idea of tikkun olam and helping, oh, sorry, I was raised Jewish. And for me, the idea of tikkun olam and supporting others and caring for others in the community comes. Um, very naturally and also something that's very important in the community. You take a, a look around at any kind of religion, every religion has an aspect of wanting to support one another, wanting to care for one another in the community. Um, you know, we don't we don't tend to have prejudice about who to help. We just recognize that we should be helped and that that is some of the best, the most important forms of how we live and operate in society, how we treat each other. Spiritually, all religions have that aspect in it, and yet we can very easily forget when we're in our day-to-day, -day, when we're driving on the freeway, when we're uh, out and about, we, we can forget those pieces of that religious connection that brings us uh, that sense of belonging, that sense of community, that sense of spiritual 
power and, and uh, meaning. I think UBI, albeit not a technically religious idea, has been supported by religious figures because they've recognized that this fundamentally is a way of following through on what we said we would do within our respective religions, caring for one another, ensuring that none of us are in poverty, ensuring that we treat each other with a basic level of respect and dignity. Like these are time honored values that translate in every religion, but we haven't somehow made it sit within our actual society. We talk about it, we can, we can think about it, we can pray about it, but we need to do a better job integrating that into society, into our day to day and, and codifying it in law. And so for me, this is as much a spiritual effort as it is about technological disruption or, you know, having the opportunity to be entrepreneurial or be creative. But there is a spiritual aspect of this that is really important because I think it gets at really feeling that we are connecting with what we believe and following through on what we say we believe. Um, I'm thinking of the housing costs in Los Angeles, and I'm just curious how the uh, basic universal income is determined in terms of monetary amount. Is it the same across the country, or is there other considerations? Yeah, great question. With with the discussion about UBI, the idea is that it would be the same amount regardless of where you live, and a couple of reasons is that. Well, actually, let me just I'll start by saying that in the situation where we have the UBI and people say, well, that won't go as far in certain places as it would in others, and that's totally understandable. But the idea is ensuring that everyone has a, uh, the same starting point. There are plenty of examples where states will provide their residents with additional income. For example, Alaska is already doing that, right? If you don't live in Alaska, you're not getting the oil dividend. But if you do live in Alaska, you do. So California sent out, I believe, uh, our, uh, debit cards a couple of months ago for people just basically because there was a surplus and they provided some income to all Californians, right? So there are other examples of states also leading the way to providing cash that may be in addition to a UBI. But it ultimately comes back to the idea of having everyone have the same fundamental starting point. And so what that means for everyone is different. If you wanna live in California, you will probably not be able to just find a place and live and pay for rent on a basic income. But you may be able to find a couple of roommates. You may be able to live maybe on the outskirts of LA and work your way into saving up to getting your own apartment in, you know, on the west side or any other part of LA because it's all expensive now. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, it's ensuring that everyone has that same level of a starting point. So if you're coming from a small community or a rural area, you may actually be stuck there because you don't have an opportunity to earn income in a, in a busy metropolitan area because you can't even get there. You can't even move into that area. There is this idea that I, I believe that there would be an actual balancing out and there would be more people willing to move into less metropolitan areas because their income would be traveling with you. So the opportunity to create a little bit more of a variety of places to live because there would be opportunities where rent is cheaper where there's an opportunity to get in on the ground floor and start a community and grow a community because your income travels with you wherever you go, at least the basic income does. So in that world, you may actually be able to relieve some pressure from major cities because people would be interested in some of the aspects of a more slow rural lifestyle that we, we just totally miss when we're living here. If you want a little bit more space, you can get a decent Wi-Fi connection and you can have you know, a little bit of acreage and some nature to yourself. That's really appealing. I think there's a, a whole world in which we get a UBI and everyone starts to make these kinds of decisions for themselves and people just start moving around and mixing in all sorts of interesting ways. I, I personally believe that there would be the formation of different kinds of communities around interest that would start popping up around the country because with a starting point of a UBI, you would have the opportunity to go create the community that makes sense for you. And so I believe that Yes, there are still needs for affordable housing, for making sure that we have opportunities for people to live in places that people want to live. But if people were to receive basic income, I think it expands the ideas of what that could look like. What are people looking for and what stage of life? Um, and I think that would be really fascinating to see. So 
yes, it would be the same for everybody, but again, it's not that either states wouldn't provide more or that everyone would just be stuck trying to get into a city, but everyone would be better equipped to make the decision that makes sense for that. Um, I'm just wondering when you say everybody, you know, go get it, it's like age 18, age 21, I mean, what's the general uh, age? Sure. That, this is where the details get in, right? So this is the general idea of UBI, and this is when the rubber meets the road, you start having a bill put together. What does it actually look like, look like right? Um, different proposals have different points where people connect. Uh, you heard about the child tax credit, right? But that is some form of a guaranteed income for kids. The general discussion around UBI is that at probably 18, when you are free to make your own decisions, you would get what would be considered the full UBI amount. If you were younger than that, your parents would probably receive the form of a, for a child basic income or, or a parental basic income, whatever it would be, that may be a little bit less because you're in a family. You can make the argument that's actually more important to have a full income for those kids so that their families could provide for those kids. But the very, the amounts vary. Uh, some proposals that were talked about during the election spoke about, I believe it was $4,000 or $5,000 per year per child. And that the full basic income, when we talk about UBI, we typically use the poverty line as the starting point. I would make the argument that the poverty line is an outdated notion. We don't do an accurate job reflecting the cost of today. So that number should be higher. But if we just use the general idea of $1,000 a month in 2020, I believe it was $12,000 a year for a single adult to technically be out of poverty. Again, kind of a low number, kind of an outdated number. But uh, yeah, so there are different levels and then you would just get it going forward. Um, and then obviously other programs, this is where you get into the topic of what programs should still exist, what programs may not be as necessary that you can fold in to pay for it. Um, but yeah, so that's all part of the discussion, all part of the the development of what we believe should be when we actually implement it. Thank you. And one of the questions on the example you showed where there are 100 pilots around the country, what, was, what is that funding side? What's the source of the uh, money? Yeah, yeah, it's a fair amount of money, right? Um, so those pilots are a mix of private and public funds. Uh, a bunch of those pilots started off being privately funded. The Economic Security Project was a major backer in the first two pilots specifically in Stockton, California, and in Jackson, Jackson Mississippi. And then there has been an influx of private capital to support a lot of these newer pilots. Also, during the pandemic, uh, the American Rescue Plan, ARPA funds, as some of which have been redirected because they were given a broad scope of what they were allowed to do to help the community. And so some of that came in the form of direct cash payments that were then turned into pilots because there was an opportunity to really see what, what the community needed and what they needed was cash. And so directing those funds directly to the most vulnerable among us who needed it the most. And from there, they were able to actually start piloting them from that. So it's been a mix of private and public capital, depending on the particulars of the pilot. We have a question from our Zoom audience. Yeah. They ask, can you explain how our broken, highly for profit healthcare system focused on reimbursement for tertiary, but not primary or preventive care will be reformed in UBI? That's an exact question. Not the easiest of questions. Like I said, UBI is not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea for all the challenges that we have. I do believe that based on the evidence that we have, as people have a basic income, as people have cash as a starting point to build their, their lives up, they have healthier, better healthcare outcomes at the starting point. And so you have less hospitalizations, you have less uh, major health challenges, you're able to address the health benefits to create a healthier lifestyle for yourself at an earlier age, which translates over time. I don't think that UBI will fundamentally potentially fix healthcare. I do believe that it will dramatically help lower healthcare costs. I think a healthier, happier populace doing the kind of work that they want to do, being less forced into dangerous work that can cause 
major health challenges, or even just lessening the stress of living a life of precarity and insecurity will lead to better healthcare outcomes, lower healthcare costs, and helping shift how our healthcare system can treat each other. One other piece is that a healthier, happier, and more secure populace gives people the mental space and ability to participate civically and to participate politically. I think a lot of these challenges we have is based on an entrenched system that gives people very little access or opportunity to spend time and energy to have their voices heard and their concerns met. <clears throat> that, that that kind of power and privilege comes from those who have the time, the resources, and the wealth to do that. If we have more people who are more secure, if we have people who have more time, we can have more people have the opportunity to participate politically, to vote in politicians and demand accountability from our politicians, to participate in the political process, and to help dismantle and rebuild many of these institutions by the people and for the people. And I believe that would definitely include healthcare. Even uh, government. A few years back, it seemed that our prison system became privatized, which coincided with uh, our country becoming the most incarcerated country in the world, a very great victory for capitalists. And at the same time, uh, I hear a lot about how many multiples uh, above said we spend multiples uh, of dollars over the second, third, or fourth most powerful militaries in the world, our, our expenditures trump, trump them. And I'm wondering if, if this program includes a plan to somehow recoup money from a military budget that we don't need for from the prison system, uh, where a lot of that money goes. Did that, did that play into the ideas that we have? I think for many people who support this idea, there is a, a growing concern about how we do spend what, how, where we spend our resources today. So I think a lot of those folks who are pushing for UBI would be happy to redirect some of the funds that are going to our military uh, that could be better put directly given to the people, right? Uh, that is a real challenge, I will be honest, when you start getting a more bipartisan group of people together, especially as one political party or affiliation may be more inclined to keep things the way they are, which is why I continue to accentuate the understanding that the cost of the system we run, we are running now more than pays for basic income should we actually invest in ourselves first and paying for itself. But yes, to the short answer is yes. A lot of people I think would look at how we spend our money today and have a real coming together as to how we can better spend and direct that money. I think part of the military's goal is to ensure security for the American people, right? I would argue that one of the best ways to ensure security for the American people is to provide economic security for the American people. And that comes in the form of providing direct service and direct cash to people. Um, that might actually decrease the kinds of challenges we're facing both here and abroad uh, by building a populace that is resilient, secure, and, and focused on the next level, what our society should be focusing on instead of potentially destruction, war, uh, disagreement, and anger and violence towards others. Uh, again, that can, that's where I can start to be a little in the clouds, but I do believe that is really important. And if that is the goal where we're directing that income, that is kind of, that is some of the money that should be going to a program like UBI. Thank you for your work, first of all. You're welcome. You're like a basic cultural shift. This country was built on very different histories. And so as we understand this cultural shift that we find attractive, if you describe policy in some text, I was studying to address that particular question with the concept of education. Because education is important in terms of understanding what is my student. And how do I get to what you did today and what kind of experience? 
Yeah. Uh, the pilots have done, I think, a really good job humanizing and bringing at the very local level what people would do if they had some income as a starting point. I think one of the main goals of the pilots wasn't necessarily to just get more data that people are using it in ways to support their families, allow their kids to have the, the school uh, tools and their laptops and the, the necessary things that they needed to go to school and get an education, have enough sleep, have enough food, all those basics, but also telling the stories of families going through this process. What does it look like to be in poverty? And what does it look like when they just have a little bit of breathing room, when they have a little bit of an opportunity? Uh, the different pilots have different groups that have been affected. So there are families that have been focused just based on poverty and how what level they're at and helping support them to get to a new level. Uh, there are other groups, uh, formerly incarcerated uh, individuals who were given a basic income to see how they might be able to improve their lives coming out of the prison system. Um, there have been groups, that's in Florida, actually, I would recommend you checking out in Gainesville, Florida. There's an entire program of formerly incarcerated folks who are receiving some income and the results of how they're able to build uh, their lives in a society that does very little to help those who are formerly incarcerated uh, is an incredible sense, uh, incredible stories and incredible data coming out of how they're able to improve their lives. So um, to keep on um, the idea of education specifically, um, I would say that having a lot of these pilots focus on families and focusing on making sure their kids have what they need to go to school, whether that's at the elementary school level, high school level, uh, preparing for college, getting help with their college application, paying for the basics that we take for granted if you have the resources to prepare for college, but even just again at the basic level, having food so that you're not hungry when you're in school. Um, you know, just a lot of the things we take for granted, a lot of families are able to start having for themselves and, and receiving, and it makes a world of difference. So there are there are stories that I can direct you to that if you're interested to find more about that particular area and aspect of people's lives. Well, one of the things that you say about language, there's a positive that can be defined, right? You can either your mother or your mom. There's a separation. There's a happiness. So is there any kind of, you know, is there any consideration of using different language? So I'm a person, I'm, I'm not a person who has a certain body level. I'm a, I'm a person who has a particular life experience. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think so. It puts a whole different spin on the way I think about it. And if I ever look at the person who comes next to me, I'm not going to say you don't want because of whatever. Right. Yeah. And I, I I just I definitely agree with that. I think when Andrew Yang was running for president, he used the framework of a freedom dividend. He spoke of it as a uh, the fact that we were such a successful uh, society that we should ensure a dividend going to everybody. And that dividend doesn't have the stigma of poverty attached to it. It doesn't have the stigma of who should and shouldn't get it because a dividend is by definition, goes to everyone who is a shareholder in, you know, what an organization, or in this case, uh, a, <laughs> that's the echo. <laughs> I guess he's on Zoom. <laughs> if I talk like this, the answer makes sense. Okay. Um, I know I, I look better on video than I do in real life, but you know, it's, I'm not a better. Um, so to, to answer the question, the framing is very important. I think that we can do a, a better job. Uh, let me take a step back. The reason that all these pilots have been focusing on folks who are in poverty, and we can sort of see that the framing is around the poverty angle, the social justice of who doesn't have enough, is because at the moment, we are still a scarcity-driven, resource-driven ideology. And so these pilots have decided that instead of trying to give it to a broader range of people, including people who are not in poverty, it was easier to focus on the most vulnerable and the most people who needed it the most. And so the stories that are coming out are based on people who really needed it the most. That is not the only argument for a UBI. And also 
like you can, I can understand, it starts to pigeonhole how we talk about this concept and who it helps. If I could, I would love for more people in a group, in a society to receive a UBI so that we could see what happens with people who have different levels of income already, what they would do with it. And we do have examples of that. But at the moment, these pilots are really focused on who needs it the most. Um, again, the freedom dividend and the idea of ensuring everyone gets a piece of it, I think is really important. And arguably are the, for me personally, the technological argument is the bipartisan space that I think is a potential way in. I know we are all here spiritually connected and driven, uh, but I think ultimately to bring in the most amount of people, there has to be an understanding of how it affects everybody directly. And it just so happens that the way our world is going, the world of technological disruption is going to affect everybody. And so there are other arguments and discussion points to be made to bringing in a broader sense of why this is important than just saying people are in poverty, we shouldn't have poverty. I, I agree with that. Hey, quick question over here. Um, and you kind of been talking about it this whole time. Um, I'm really interested in uh, hearing about Challenges and the uh, almost backups that you may be receiving and trying to uh, present it to people. And why it's important to understand the backlash, why it's important to understand the, uh, those challenges, and um, how those that backlash can be changed to almost all. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> it's been an interesting journey seeing how different groups have resonated with this idea in different ways and what are the challenges both when I speak about it, but also just the broader sense of the UBI community. One of the challenges that I've tried to work with is understanding my audience. So I've spoken to different audiences about UBI and I do a little bit of changing how I speak about UBI, depending on who's my audience, right? If I'm in a room of folks who are, say, Iowa, like Midwest, rural, are interested in, have different beliefs than I have on many different issues. Do I talk to them in the same way as I do if I were in downtown LA speaking to you all here? There are some changes there. I might speak more to traditional values of individual freedom, opportunity, decision-making that's up to you and not the government, less paternalism, um, you know, that those kinds of things to emphasize uh, or, or talk about the kinds of work that they do that are at danger of being automated, the work that's specific to them. Um, I may not talk as much about other, other aspects of it or poverty or things like that because it just doesn't resonate with that. With that audience. So one of the challenges in the UBI movement is when we talk at a very high level there are, always, there are always groups that may feel not quite as connected to the message. The beauty of UBI is that you can really connect this in many different ways to different groups, but you really have to be intentional with how you're presenting it and what you're talking about. So I think for a long time, UBI has been presented as this is the solution for poverty, full stop. That's what we should talk about. We just focus on people's stories. And if people just heard how much it would help them and help the people who need it most, problem solved. We would do it, we would do it right? And that, that hasn't happened yet. Right? There's just a large group of people that that doesn't resonate with, that they feel that there is others and that they believe those people have made decisions that you know have caused them to be in the situation they're in. They themselves personally have done it differently. So having different messages for different groups has been a real challenge and something that the UBI movement has been working on. And that is also why I am really kind of driven by finding this bipartisan space. And for me, that messaging is that we are all being affected by technology. And it might seem a little California West Coast, hey, look at all the, you know, the self-driving cars that are over here. That's not really a thing in the rest of the country, but it is, and I think that's what resonated with Andrew and his, his way of speaking to people across the country. It wasn't seen as a bipartisan issue. The kinds of labor that people are doing, that transcends what you believe politically. So I think there are areas in which to focus messaging on, and then there are areas in which we can bring everyone together under a broader umbrella of how do we talk about UBI and why we might need it. And for me, the technology angle really is 
that umbrella that can bring everyone together while still having these individual group conversations and going deeper into why a particular group should resonate with the idea. And then just the other thing around the challenges, there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't know if you've seen or heard, but like, it seems like there's just, the world is on fire at all times. And so an idea like this that is seen as expensive or, or large and uh, almost too big of an idea, it gives people pause and they're thinking, I need to worry about other things right now. I got to worry about who's going to get elected, you know, this cycle. I'm going to worry about, you know, all sorts of other rights. I'm going to be worried about what rights might get taken away from what I just have today, right? So really working on trying to portray what our future might look like and building the coalition of politicians to support this, because ultimately it comes down to getting approximately four to 500 people on Capitol Hill to believe in this idea. And that's not easy. UBI doesn't have great lobbyists because there's not a whole lot of money in it. There are individuals in the community who recognize this and are starting to fund these ideas. And there's, there's a growing amount of support, but it's not a huge constituency and such a big idea. People are like, we'll deal with that later. Well, later is coming up very quickly. So I think we're gonna hit that point where like the pandemic or another moment in time, we're gonna have to face a choice. And my hope is that we have educated and explained this idea well enough to enough people that when that moment in time comes again, we can introduce this idea and have that be the catalyst for moving it forward quickly. It'll be short, small steps, and this is going to come all at once. So thank you, Joshua, because that leads right into what my question is in terms of the, um, I'm sitting here thinking about the upcoming election, wondering if this is resonating any in any way. I know it isn't on one side, but you know, I, I don't know if any of our current politicians are starting to align with this idea. Do you see any up and comers who are on board with this who would be the the leaders into our future on this topic? And it's obviously a long game, and you're, you're continuing to plant the seeds uh, that Andrew's saying. Um, but what's your perspective on that, really, in terms of, you know, who are the upcoming players that we might need to support? I think that's a very important question, right? Where are we looking to our elected leaders to focus our time, attention, and, and continue to nudge them toward making this a broader point in, in legislating. There are a couple of basic income bills in some form or another that are being introduced in Congress. There is discussion around doing a United States level basic income trial or pilot. I believe that we have all the pilots that we need, but there are people who would like to see a broader, more um, entirely US-based pilot done. There are other groups, such as those who focus on the child tax credit, like the video said, a focus on a, a guaranteed income for children. I think that's a great stepping stone and a bridge for people to recognize when children and their families have some income and have those basics met. It, it pays itself off in huge, huge dividends. We already saw that during the pandemic when we opened up the child tax credit, we allowed Anyone who, even if they earned zero dollars a year, were able to qualify for it for the first time. We made it more easily refundable, more easily able to be received and applied for. And it pulled, like the video mentioned, half of all children out of poverty, like, like that. So we know it can be done and we need to remember that it can be done and we need to continue pushing politicians. And it's not just who you might imagine as Democrats or folks who may be more focused on social policy. Uh, there are some Republicans out there who recognize this because of their constituency, the challenges that their folks face, whether it's through challenges in job displacement or the fact that there's just not a lot of opportunity locally. Um, there are others on both sides of the aisle who are starting to see this and they're starting to understand this. Uh, another group of people you can look toward are the mayors who are guaranteed income. That is a large group of mayors, those who are really on the front lines of working with communities and where they live, who are giving cash directly to their constituents and, and seeing the positive results and are pulling that information and, and telling those stories and bringing it up for a broader audience. So I would actually look to see many of the mayors, I imagine, as their, their terms of service, their, their, their time in service uh, may come to a close, they may start running for other offices. 
so I would look for them as well. Uh, and and ultimately, you know, Andrew didn't wasn't asked to do this, right? Andrew wasn't invited to talk about Nubia, right? He decided to took upon himself to make this the core issue and to spend several years, even when no one was listening, talking about this to everywhere he could until he was able to gather enough momentum. So you'd probably be surprised where this support may come from. It may come from a Gen Z who is running for office for the first time and is like, well, yeah, of course we need UBI and all these other things, right? It could come from somebody who's been personally affected by the child tax credit, who has been a recipient of one of these uh, different pilots. Uh, it may just be somebody who recognizes that this, this time has come and this time is different. That technology is changing things and from a, a different perspective altogether. But uh, I, I can definitely send anyone who's interested resources as to who might be some of those leaders, but it's up to us to encourage and nudge those who are running to consider this idea, because even if it's just a seed in their minds, God forbid, should we have another moment like a pandemic or some other moment in time where we're going to have to make a choice, having that pressure on those to those uh, officials and having that infrastructure built in so that when the time is right, that's when we put on the pressure and say, this is the moment. That's when I'm imagining how it's actually going to take place. I know there's so many. I know. Wonderful. I'll, I'll stick around for a little longer. We can yeah. definitely talk. So. I also first of all, want to thank you for coming. Again, oh. I know Sherry will wrap it up, but um, I do want to say that this topic is um, so important, and I think our community in a larger way will want to really help with these steps that we talked about. And I think a further discussion, maybe thinking about it to bring it to a larger audience, maybe at a college or university, a forum, where we could really strategize this and some of our other social justice topics to move forward as they, they connect so right. perfectly. So hold on for a, a bigger ask soon. Of course. And also from our audience, a bigger ask. I think that topics like this are, um, are crucial to our future and it's not now when, as you said. So we're already strategizing in the back room of how to do, how to further this and not only just drop with our audience. And uh, I invite Sherry back up to wrap it up. And again, I'm sorry for people who weren't able to ask questions. We promised people on Zoom and also people who've left work so we can get so they can get back to work. But thank you, Pam. Larry, thank you for helping us dream of a better future, a more inclusive future, a future in which everybody's dignity and freedom is respected in terms of their economic status. I mean, that, that was a new concept for me today, but we pull that all together. So thank you for, you know, tweaking our brains and helping us kind of wake up to this uh, issue in, in a new way. And please check out the resources um, that, that uh, Larry has given us. And again, think about ways that you can educate yourself more about this, how you can promote this concept uh, and get behind, it sounds like get behind the politicians that are already kind of on board with this and listen as you're listening to them, you know, in whatever forum, you know, what are their views on this and, and start asking some critical questions. So, thank you so much. Let's give Larry a hand. Thank you.